Welcome home, where we talk about the transformation from troops and boots to veterans in the civilian world. I'm Andy Wines, he's Dylan Sessler, and it's our weekly therapy session where we talk to each other and or guests about what it's like to be veterans here in the civilian world. Uh, so no guests, Dylan, you and I, for the first time in a while, we've had a, quite a few guests lately. Yep. And uh, what's uh, what do you want to talk about this week? What's on your mind? Uh everything there's all sorts of things in my mind um let's let's let's, <laughs> let's have a conversation as as people do and see let's, if we come up with the like the, the game like two truths and a lie right like yeah. we'll have a conversation <laughs> and see if we come up with uh uh <laughs> something <laughs> well you know what like what i think is interesting the podcasts that i enjoy the most are one or two things it's either the ones where it's like someone's talking right at you it's very clear it's like yep this is the thing like uh Mel Robbins does a great job of those. Like, all right, for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to tell you why you got to think this way. It's like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> um, or where it's like the Joe Rogan approach where it's like, hi, I have this guest and we're going to talk for the next three hours. And and then that's it, right? And there's like yep. no agenda. There, there's certainly something to be said, like Jordan Peterson, there's a lot of great content he does that's interview style. I like those more in videos. But when it comes to listening, or, and when it comes to listening, I, I prefer either very conversational or one person. So, um and 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 uh, it, well, at least for me in this podcast that we do, it's conversational and also keeps me somewhat attached to the military community because um, in my new position in the army, I'm a IMA, I'm an individual, um, uh, individually uh, mobilized augmentee. It took me a second there to remember what the hell that meant, which basically means I only show up a few times a year. Like mm -hmm. I'm very highly specialized job. I do it. I, 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 for the first time now in 19 years, I'm no longer going to drill once a month. And that's been like three months now. And that's weird. I haven't shaved in three months. It must be nice. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> what, what, you know what it is? Here's, here's the biggest challenge I have. Um, a, I don't know when to get a haircut anymore. And then <laughs> B, I get like for the, the people who are watching, we actually more, we have more people that watch on YouTube than listen as a podcast, which is interesting. Anyways, for people watching on YouTube, I have the neck beard going. Um, because I, I have to like knock down, I used to just grow my beard until I had to shave and then I would start over. And now it's like, oh, I have to trim every now and then. So that's interesting. <laughs> um, and, and, and it's, it's weird. I'm like, I'm slowly losing my connection to the military because I'm not hanging out with soldiers once a month, which I knew what was going to happen. And now that it's happening, it's like, oh, okay, this is, uh, this is all part of the gig. So, yeah. and that's it. It's interesting. Cause like. I, uh, the, the, the friends that I kind of gather with, um, especially in the summertime, which is where I was this last weekend, um, mm -hmm. are ex military, right? Like we, we do this, uh, we do family camping together with, with three of the families that I deployed with, or three of the people that I deployed with. Um, and then also we do a canoe trip and mm -hmm. this last weekend we did our canoe trip and one of my friends, uh, dislocated his ankle right before so he couldn't come my other friend came and one of my soldiers came um and what i realized is my one of my other friends brought some other people who are local to the area and i noticed they were with themselves right and then me and my soldier um were just kind of mm -hmm. we were over fishing right because it, it was in in part, I think the mentalities are so dramatically different from being a civilian and, and kind of, you know, they bring whatever they want. They, you know, they hang out. There's there's no rush. There's no urgency or anything like that. And then mm -hmm. me and my guy are just like, we don't want to talk to people when we're out in nature because nature is our peace. Like it, mm -hmm. it, it really comes to, um, we really come out there to not engage with people. Um, and and especially this just kind of being out in the woods and being on the, on the water. Um, we really engage with being able to support each other without words, right? Just mm -hmm. because that's, that's the nature of our business. Um, especially being, uh, snipers in the infantry, like we, if you don't have to talk, don't talk. Right. And so me and him just kind of fished and, and did what we wanted to do and caught some fish, cooked them up, you know, and kind of separated ourselves from the, from the pack, um, the pack of civilians that we didn't really connect with. Um, and my other buddy 
had has been out for five, five, six, seven years. I don't even know how long, but um, you can just see the transition happening of like when you when you step out of the military, you lose that sense of urgency or that that need to be, you know, on edge or as hard. And I, I see that more uh, as my friends kind of age out of the military and away from the military now. Um, mm -hmm. And I notice I notice myself, too, right? Like I, I see the the difference of who I am compared to who they are now. Um, and not only that, but like who I started off as in the military and who I am now. Um, and I think that's really interesting to kind of think about um, and, and to see that for the first time and kind of play out uh, is is also really interesting and, and kind of makes me makes me wonder about myself of like, how do I, is that, is that okay? Um, am I doing, um, am I self isolating too much? Um, stuff like that. It just makes you, makes you put, put things into perspective a little bit. Well, what you said is interesting is though, is the other guys have gotten out. Mm -hmm. So I don't really hang out with anybody that's still in the military other than the guys that when I went to drill, like I don't have my, my one buddy, and uh, he's got like 32 years in. He's 34 years in. Anyways, he's old. It's like 52. And he's in, but he's in, in kind of the same capacity I'm in, where it's like we're not around troops. We're not doing the thing. Um, and, and, and then all my other buddies are vets, and most of them were, you know, four and done or maybe six or eight and done. None of them were um, reservists or, you know, National Guard for any substantial period of time. So it's like they did the military it's been, it's been off their list for a while. Kind of like Danny O'Malley at our, our first um, episode uh, when, when, when he was talking about, um, you know, when he was done, he was done. And then there's some day you have to wake up and be like, oh, I'm, you know, Danny today, not, or Andy or Dylan, right? I'm not, uh, you know, Marine or I'm not a veteran. And so in that regard, it's different for me because most of the people I hang out with are veterans or they're full on civilians. I don't, I don't have a big group. And often when I go in groups, business or otherwise, I'm the only veteran there. So it's interesting you talk about like the, uh, the solitude or the go, go, go. It's like whatever or however you show up, it, it, it's a sense of feeling that you're different than others. And often um, I get the kind of costed for this by my girlfriend should be like, well, why is it because you're a veteran? Like, why does that have to be the first identifying thing that separates you from everything else i'm like well because it's pretty significant yeah. like with you for example like you talk about sitting there fishing with your buddy and you're like oh because we're snipers and because we can enjoy the peace and solitude and be at peace and it's like well or maybe you're people that enjoy the peace and solitude and other people don't however your brain went first to because <laughs> we're veterans right yeah. and i'm not saying you're right or wrong it's an interesting observation yeah right and then it's also like well is it because you're snipers, you enjoy peace and solitude, or is it you enjoy peace and solitude and therefore you're snipers? Probably a little bit right? of both. Right. There's that predisposition. Yeah. And again, from the outside, it could be like, well, what's the biggest difference between me and everybody else? Oh, I'm a veteran. They're not. It's like, well, then it's like you chalk it up. And I'm not saying you're right. However, if you chalk it up as the only contributing factor, you 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 might be missing some critical information there. Um, Certainly. Yeah, and, and the challenge I have is when I'm the only um, military member or veteran in a room, it's like either A, it plays no factor, and then you're like, oh, this kind of sucks. I don't really have anybody to talk to. Or B, it, it, it's, a situ it, it's a situation where it's like people come to you and think you're the expert on all things military because you, you have more experience than everybody else in the room combined. And it's like, well, that also isn't true. So where's that, you know? How much of being a veteran impacts your daily life is like there's not this perfect equation. It's, it's it's a burden you carry with you all day, every day. And it's um, how do you regulate in real time? So it best serves you today. Right. You know, it's, for you, it's like, like, was, was it better or worse that you were fishing in solitude? Better yeah. in my opinion, right? Like I, hmm. pretty rarely do I get that, that stark contrast kind of laid out for me because I, you know, I work from home. So I do so much from home. I don't get, I don't have to talk to people all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, unless it's my clients and, and the work that I do, which is work that I enjoy. Um, I'm not particularly a 
extroverted person. I don't want to go meet new people I've never met before and talk to them about, you know, the random ins and outs of Sauk City and, you know, school systems that I'd, I've never heard of. Um, so it's like, I, one of the things I, I, I recognize about myself is obviously that I do, I do certainly enjoy my isolation and I've, I've always recognized that and I, I've always loved that. Uh, but I'm very comfortable with the people I'm comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Um, the people I'm not comfortable with, I don't intend or desire to have comfort with those people or need it. So I'm, I'm perfectly okay being on my own and doing my own thing. Um, and, and, and yeah, I mean, like, I, I think in a lot of ways that, that came from, um, that infantry mindset over the years. Like, I, I think, I think infantry is, is almost a, a deeper, a deeper identity than veteran itself. Mm -hmm. Because, because as an infantryman, we, we already know that we're segregated from a vast majority of society because like, I mean, our, our job is to move to contact. Like that's our job. Mm -hmm. Like we go to people that shoot us. And so like there, we, we always identify as these people that are, uh, that are different, you know, and then that becomes, uh, kind of integrated into that veteran mindset but we always kind of have that feeling that we're we're still different from even the standard range packets of veterans that you see you know motor t or uh supply guys like you just look at infantrymen and, and they're they're different and that's not to say they're they're any better or worse it's just like and in, in many ways i look at my mindset and say sometimes it's it's, it's worse right because it's like I do self isolate, uh, in a lot of ways. And that that's just not always a good thing. It's not always a good option because I could absolutely use support in certain circumstances where I, I would actually determine for myself that I can do it myself. Right. Yeah. Um, even though there's a plethora of people that would gladly help me and, and be there for me. Um, so it's, it's, it kind of has this, it takes on a form of its own, uh, that identity. And I think that's actually really the, the contrast I see more than veteran. I think, I think people identify with the jobs, uh, in the military sometimes more than they identify with the actual statement of being a veteran. Oh, no, there, there's absolutely that it's, you know, it's, it starts with military and then it's your branch of service. Yeah. And then it's, you know, like, uh, enlisted versus officer, right. There's a yeah. little bit of that. And then your MOS, and yeah, I would say, you know, the infantry is like the even more uh, identifiable because it's like infantry or or no, or right because it's a <laughs> infantry or a pogue, yeah, right. And then and I'm I, and it's funny you brought up motor T because it's like I I I'm motor T and I'm like I'm not that proud of it. I'm not like not proud of it. I'm like yeah, I'm talking motor T. I'm not like you know like there's not a lot of people that get motor T tattoos. Um, <laughs> infantry. <laughs> Right. And then I was also military police for a while. And the unit I joined was law and order. Um, because in the reserves, you're more specific, you know, when you're whatever active duty, like you'll have LNO, you know, on the state side, or you're like a combat arms, you know, or whatever phase, right. Or, or, you know, um, detentions, corrections. So we were LNO. So we had a bunch of cops and they were all about being cops. And then like being military was secondary. Yeah. Right. And, and, and so, and a lot of the guys that I was in the unit with were either security guards cops or corrections, you know, officers in the civilian world. So it's like, now they're in like that, that bucket, you know? Um, and so absolutely, you know, when we raise our right hand and we join the military, it's one thing. And then we identify with the job or the people we serve with. And like, we're, you know, being motor T, for example, like you're just, you're the dirt bags. You're the dirt bags that drive the truck, death before dismount, whatever. <laughs> like it is what it is, right? That's, that's, that's how she goes. Um, and then when we were military police, it's like, we never got shit on. Like when I tell people like on the active duty side, I was like, oh, I'm more, you know, military police. So I do fucking gate guard or goddamn LNO, <laughs> like fucking whatever. Like they hate him. It's like, no, dude, like I was, I was in the reserves. I've never done LNO in my life. I spent a year in Gitmo and it sucked. And it's like, oh, okay, all right, whatever, fine. Um, so we don't have that even further isolation 
like you do in infantry because you guys, you know, you guys get together and it's like in your, uh, in, you know, mutually embracing the suck and loving it. <laughs> and there's, well, there's something you said about that, you know, it's true. That's, that's it. Like, yeah. who's going to like, that's our like, job. It, it, it is embracing the suck. And, and, and that's also like a little bit of how society goes. Like there's this, now we have this society now where it's like, whoever can claim the most victimhood wins the prize of, you know, most fucking uh, entitled, I guess. I don't know. Maybe that's just something work. Uh, there's definitely something in the military though, about when you embrace the suck together, it's like the shittier it is, the, the cooler you feel or the better you feel. <laughs> it's true. It, it just is. That's, it's why, like, that's why Marines are so vocal. <laughs> God. Cause it's like, you knew, you know, every Marine goes through the shittiest of shit, yep. you know? And then to them, it's like, that it then it, and then you get to this this fraternity where it's like well yeah yeah they like, just, that's what I did they just eat their crayons together and, and now and, and and I love it because it it's everybody is capable of going beyond what they think they're capable of mm -hmm. and whatever that means there was a hell of a lot more people that could be in the military and could be successful in the military had their raised the right hand they chose not to because of their own limiting self beliefs. And then it goes back to what I was saying earlier. It's like, are you, you know, are you a sniper because you enjoy solitude or you enjoy solitude and therefore you're a sniper? It's like with people in the military, we have a predisposition of like, oh yeah, I, I, I can, I can handle worse. I can embrace the suck. I can willingly walk into a situation that I have no control over and I'm, I'm willing to see how it shakes out. Yeah. And a lot of people, especially in the civilian world that want a level of control or, you know, input or it's like, yeah, that ain't, that ain't how the military works. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, so it's like, could they physically do it and emotionally do it? Yes. Could they mentally deal with the fact that they're no longer in charge? Probably not. That, that might, that, that level of self-control is the one thing that they, they can't give up. Yeah. And then, and then you come into the civilian world. That's why, like I read about in my book, you know, one of my chapters is, but did you die? And that's a total <laughs> military thing. Yeah. But it's like, okay, but did you die? Like you're bitching. I hear you bitch. I got it. Yep. I, I, I understand. You know, your kid had a fussy day. Your boss sucks. I'm, I'm tracking like a high five ECR. <laughs> Um, did you die? Oh, you didn't. Oh, okay. Then what are we, uh, what are we doing here? Like, why, why are we still talking about this? One of, one of you my, know? one of my favorite quotes from like military movies is from uh lone survivor <laughs> when they're, they just take contact on the mountain and yeah. Danny, uh, I can't remember his last name, but Danny takes, I think he gets shot, like shot in the, in the shoulder and then like also loses a finger. I think he loses a finger or something like that. Um, and he, he's like coughing up and like asking for help. And, uh, somebody looks over at him and says, you're living in the past, Danny living in the past. And it's just like, <laughs> that is, that is the most, uh, <laughs> like that's the most military and infantry kind of mindset of like, y you have to get over what's happening and, and get back in the, into the game. You know, and it, it's just, it's just one of those quotes that has, has always stuck with me. Um, because it's like, that's, that's the reality of like, you're in this moment where the shit's hitting the fan. And if you, if you don't check your emotional, uh, you know, your, your emotional expansion of, I don't want to be here, then you're going to die or you're, you're going to lose something. Right. And that's kind of like, that's the the world that at least me as an infantryman uh, and especially as a sniper like we have to safeguard uh, other people from our emotions to make sure that we can clarify how we fit into the scenario and how we actually fit into the reality and make everything work around us um, mm -hmm. and that's that's one of the you know when I because I'm a sniper section leader so I, I work I got nine guys underneath me. Um, I've got to train three E fives, three sergeants to actually do that for themselves and for their two guys. Right. Um, and, and prepare them to potentially go out on their own, hide amongst, you know, people all over the place and be able to still conduct their business, you know, not get surrounded, not get, uh, not get caught and then be able to return, you know, and, and get home. And it's, it's remarkable to, to think that like, especially my job, 
you know, like my job is to train them and, and to mm -hmm. help them become more aware of how to engage them in, in, in developing that mindset to stay in reality um, and not allow their emotions to kind of take control. Um, and to think about like the tactics that we use to get them there. Uh, it's really, it's just a really interesting kind of situation, especially in, in where I'm at in life uh, of, of how to, how to help people get there as well as kind of think about the long-term side effects of that. Um, you know, especially now seeing that, that contrast with, with some of my friends now that are, that are long, a long time out of the military and have kind of moved into being a family, um, being a family man or, you know, moving into just living the civilian life. And it's just remarkably different. And to them, it's outdated. They don't need it in, in, in any capacity, it seems, which is really interesting. Yeah. I mean, it, it, at, at this point, it's, um, it no longer serves them. Yeah that's what it comes down to. Like, because you still go once a month, um, because I am, um, still like, I still answer emails, a couple, you know, like I had a call last week when my, my masks aren't, um, you know, cause I'm still, you know, it, it still serves me. There's going to be a day where it's like the military mindset, that thinking, or, you know, no longer serves me. Um, and that's, and that's the, the, the natural evolution, right? We talk about this podcast, right? That this transformation is, you know, it's not the transition that we're sold during transition assistance program, right? Like, well, like, oh, hey, <laughs> you're a veteran now, so go to the VFW and do the parade, and in 18 months, you'll magically be this new person. It's a constant transformation, and, and it changes, um, you know, it, it, it changes based off of where you are at in your life. And I, I talk about this in my life, right? Self-awareness, self-regulation, and then self-reflection. It's like, you don't, you don't realize it sometimes in the moment, right? It, how you're, if you're unaware, first off, how you are showing up. And if you are showing up, you know, regulate, is this serving you? Yes or no. And if it is good on you, right? And then in, in only in reflection, can you say, did it actually work out? And then you can regulate again. And so that's a constant mindset. What, what I, what I get a kick out of is when you see the guys that have been out for 20 years and they haven't evolved one iota and they bitch about the way the civilian world is. It's like, well, guy, yeah. th this is the world you're in. And often those aren't the people that were in for 20 years. They were all the people that were in for four years. Yep. It's like, they got stuck in it. And it's like, come on, like, what's your deal here? Um, the other thing I, I did write this down as you were talking, um, I've never seen the movie Lone Survivor. That's one of the movies I've avoided. Um, I've avoided a lot of movies from our generation of war movies, and I watch I watch war something every day. Like there's not a right. It's, my therapist told me it's probably not healthy. Um, whether it's you know YouTube videos on the Ukraine war or videos or documentaries on World War Two, Vietnam, um, World War One. Like I, I love, oh man, I, I love those eras and I, I love learning more and more about war and conflict. Hell, I, I like watching stuff about the, the Cold War, the, you know, the, whatever. I, I, I love war and it's, you know, from American perspective. Um, and yet I, I stay away from most of the um, war movies that were from, the, you know, about the last 20 years. Although Generation Kill was like phenomenal, and I would watch that over in a heartbeat. That I mean, it was phenomenal, and also it fucking yeah, man, it fucked with me big time. Um, I've never seen Lone Survivor, even though I've seen tons of clips of it or about it. Um, how do you? I just want to go in that vein. How does that? Does it bother you watching war movies? How does that serve you? That's that's one of those topics that where people are like, uh, you know, that, it's one of those like standard PTSD. I can't watch <laughs> war movies, and it's like. No, I get fucked up. Like, remember watching Generation Kill? I'm like, fuck yeah. And then yeah. it was, was, wasn't was great, Bob. Wasn't great after that for a while. Yeah. And then, and now, right, that regulation <laughs> is I, I, I avoid certain things like that because, you know, that seems to be healthy for me uh, or more healthy than the alternative. So, how, you know, you obviously you've watched <laughs> Warren Survivor. Yeah. Um, and how then do you regulate what, not, not only movies or whatever, but how do you regulate all, 
uh, data that you input into your brain. And maybe yeah. we can use movies or TV because it's a pretty simple medium. How do you regulate that so that you are your best self? For for some context, Lone Survivor happened about three miles away from where I was uh, where I was stationed in my first deployment. So it was, yeah, it was interesting. Um, yeah, like oh, I remember that hill. Yeah, yeah. It, it's um, I do it now, and I have no issues. But that's that wasn't how it always was. Right. Like when mm -hmm. I came home from my first deployment, um, apparently I didn't understand trauma. Imagine that. Mm. Um, yeah, go figure. And, and, and so I did something akin to, uh, exposure therapy. Um, and I just, I just triggered myself constantly. Right. Like I remember, I remember when Fury came out and I watched Fury for the first time, which is a World War II movie about, uh, tankers. But there was there was stuff that happened in in Fury that just kind of just brought back some of the stuff that I've seen, um, and it and it just it was very triggering for me, uh, and and just continuously kind of put me into, uh, you know, the state of PTSD, and and just elevating all of my all of all of the nightmarish feelings that that i felt when i was when i was deployed um and that is both negative and positive at that point because i also had i was lucky enough to kind of have support around me that allowed me to kind of do that to, to mm -hmm. be triggered and and to yet at the same time recognize that there were safe people around me um i give a lot of credit to my friend carrie who uh you know, when I first came home from Afghanistan, I would go out to the bars with him. Um, I, I don't, I didn't drink. I still, I've never drank, but I would still go out to bars because he wanted to go and other people would go and I'd be social. Um, but the amount of people surrounding me was a massive trigger. It was a, it was a moment. It would be a moment where I would, I would just be kind of locked in on watching everybody and be hyper vigilant. Um, and Carrie would always, I would always remember him putting putting his hand on my shoulder and just reminding me that I was that he was still there. So it was like mm -hmm. exposure therapy was was kind of how I learned how to self regulate. But I needed uh, I needed the safety aspect to be there. I needed Carrie to be there to to remind me that I wasn't just hyper vigilant and aware of everything because I was under threat. He was there reminding me that the threat wasn't as real as I thought it was, right? It wasn't Afghanistan. It wasn't where I had been. Um, so like watching movies like that, as I did it with safe in, in safe situations, I learned I was able to kind of put the feelings and the emotions that I was having into contrast with what was really happening, the reality. I was, I was stepping into reality with that exposure mm -hmm. where someone was able to look at me and say, hey, you're good. Now, it was obviously remarkably uncomfortable and it didn't always work, you know, didn't always work out as well as it, it, it could have. But in a lot of ways, I think that is kind of the process is you have to, that's what therapy can be used for, but it's really hard because your therapist or your, your mental health coach or whoever you're going to isn't always going to be there when one of these situations happens, but it's remarkably beneficial to have somebody that can understand, Hey, you're being triggered right now and just be there. And just to show you that, that they're present and to allow you to feel all of those things. And then kind mm -hmm. of debrief in the aftermath is what me and Carrie would always do is, you know, we would, we would stay up late, you know, two in the morning. I remember sitting on my front steps with, with him just talking about, you know, what I was feeling. I remember him walking out, you know, walking me outside the bar and just walking home, um, allowing me to just be myself and just feel what I needed to feel. And then, you know, he was always there. It was, you know, it was a situation that I was, I'm really grateful to have someone that could be just intuitive enough to, to pay attention to what I was actually feeling at the moment and 
not feel like he needed to do anything crazy just to be present. And, and I think the presence was, was really the, the, the kind of healing, uh, medicine that I think I needed throughout, throughout that time, you know, everybody's different, but that was certainly what allowed me to, to overcome it. But it was also, there was a lot of courage for me to actually open up to Carrie and talk about that stuff. So he actually had enough information to work with, to know what to do. If that makes sense. Hmm. No, absolutely. Now, a couple of things you said there. So you said, so exposure therapy, you were going into certain situations to expose yourself, right? I mean, so there was, there was a, well, at first I didn't know that, <laughs> right? but after the first well, like if you time, watch a movie, yeah. well, like if you watch a movie, like you got to know that, Hey, this night, this might not be great. No. Yeah. I mean, well, it's, there's some ignorance to it as well. Like sometimes you just yeah. go to a movie and like, I didn't, I didn't really have a, a lot of extreme reactions to movies. I never really have. Um, hmm. it, it was usually, um, it, it, a lot of my extreme responses were groups, groups of people. It, it's okay. So, so you knew before, like you didn't just like wake up in a bar. So like, you knew no. that you were walking into a bar, for example, right? The first right. time I didn't, I had no clue. Um, right. you, you didn't, well, and, you knew you were walking to a bar. You didn't know that you were yeah. about to have yourself a situation. Right. And, and that first time I remember, uh, again, Carrie, right? Like the first time I went, Carrie was with me. Um, and I, I started walking into, I think mean, it was a hundred, hundred people in a very small space. And I'm just like, I'm freaking out, right? Like I'm, I'm losing my, I'm losing my mind looking at everything around me. And Carrie was behind me. Um, and somebody and, and else, quick, did you deploy, did you deploy with Carrie? No, no, Carrie's okay, a right, full right. civilian. Oh, um, full, okay. All right. Got it. Yep. So somebody else was leading. So Carrie was behind me, but he was noticing exactly what I was doing. And I remember him grabbing me and I turned around real fast. Like I was, I was about to punch somebody. Cause like, if you grab me, like at that time, there's, you know, I wasn't feeling like I was safe. So I was, I was on, I didn't punch him, but he knew he kind of knew that something was happening. He, he kind of ducked it a little bit. He's like, you all right. And I'm like, uh, I couldn't even speak at that point. Um, and he just immediately took me outside. Um, we went for a walk for 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And, and he just sat there with me, you know, and, and that's when we started having conversations about it. Um, but yeah, after that, it was, it was a, a kind of known exposure of like, yeah, we're going to do this. Or like, at least I said, like, I'm going to do this. Um, because I don't, a, a lot of the times I was like, I'm, I'm not going to live my life being, um, being afraid to be around people. You know, there's, there was definitely a lot of, I had to have a lot of courage to do some of it because it was, it never felt comfortable, um, for, for the first two years. I mean, there, mm. there was no comfort when I, when I went out until I started to, uh, be more around people I knew. Um, so whenever I went out with my good friends, I started to, you know, after about a year to two years, I started to feel more comfortable being out, um, with a bunch of people around, but there, there were still moments where you pack a bar tight enough and I hated it. I just felt like a situation that was going to blow up and I, I just didn't like it. Okay, so so a couple of things. What, what the other question I have for you, because uh, this is interesting, it goes back to our very first episode. Yeah. You said you don't drink. You didn't drink then, or you don't drink now, or you never drink. Never have. Never have. Okay, that's interesting. Um, and the reason I bring that up is I quit drinking in mid March. Mm -hmm. I, I talked about this on this podcast. Yep. And I really haven't talked about it another place other than this podcast. I don't think I've talked about it um, other than you know people in the real world. Um, and and what when when uh, when Danny talked about that on our very first episode, like it hit me. Yeah. It was like, man, one more thing. And there's this guy, Andrew uh, Huberman. Huber, I can remember yep. his fucking name. Is it Huberman? Like neuroscience. Neuroscience guy. And even I watched another video this weekend, where there's a random one where he's like, yeah, when people that drink all the time, like it actually works out better for them because they're always they always have this chemical cocktail going on, so it, like it literally regulates. 
And actually, it's worse for people that drink sometimes, you know, whether it's one or two drinks a night or they only get drunk on weekends or only drink heavy on weekends, not necessarily drunk. It's because then their cortisol levels and their, you know, the stress hormones kick off um, more often. So it's like, yeah, so it's like, yeah, drinking makes you feel relaxed. It's like because not drinking makes you feel stressed and it's right and not drinking when you're used to drinking. And so whatever, I, I haven't had a drink now since March. Um, and I find that it, I, I, I find that interesting that you were going to bars to socialize and be around people, which is absolutely exposure. And I, I don't like being around people or in bars and, and drinking is a great place. Since I've stopped drinking, I basically don't go to bars, which I, me stopping drinking wasn't even that big of a deal. Even some people are like, why'd you stop drinking? You barely drank anyways before that. I'm like, well, I barely drank until I did. And, mm -hmm. and, and some word is just to not drink at all than to really choose when I'm going to drink and when I'm not going to drink. Sounds stupid, <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's overly simplified. Let me tell you that, right. you know? So, um, so yeah, it's, it's something, um, it, it, those are two things I picked up on. And then the third thing is it's, well, which I love is exposure therapy, right? I don't care if you're afraid of spiders or people. Like go spend some time with them because your fear is irrational more than likely. And your brain doesn't discern. I talk about this in my book, uh, words fucking matter. Retrain your brain to use language that serve you plug. Um, I talk about this in your book, uh, Dr. Bill Crawford, the guy I interviewed, um, which really is his, his studying is the basis to my, the scientific part of my book is that your brain cannot discern um, reality from not reality. If you perceive it to be true, your brain responds mm -hmm. and often reacts accordingly. So if you walk into those situations saying, hey, this is going to suck and I'm, I'm going to feel overwhelmed, well, your brain's going to be like, well, let's just, you know, dial in the cocktail, the chemical cocktail now so that you feel overwhelmed and stressed. And yeah. that's what we're going with, you know. Um, and if you go into it like, hey, you know what, this is okay. Well, your brain still might fuck with you when you get in there. However, you've already pre-programmed it because you're walking into and exposing yourself in a um, somewhat uh, controlled setting. Right. Because you're at least putting the inputs into your brain. And that's like anything else in life. If you go into it saying, this is going to suck, you're probably right. It's going to suck. You have, a you have a predisposition for it sucking. And it's not superstition. It is you are anticipating a negative outcome. And yeah. Harvard Business Journal did a study on this recently, basically saying that, you know, nervousness is like the neutral, right? Nervousness, okay, you're nervous because you care. Got it. That's the zero mark. And that's like negative 10 is anxiety and plus 10 is excitement. And what it comes down to is, do you perceive an, a positive outcome? If you perceive a positive outcome, you're going to feel excited. If you perceive a negative, or if you anticipate a negative outcome, not perceive, anticipate a negative outcome, you're going to feel anxious. Mm -hmm. It's the same as a comp chemical composition, feeling nervous. Uh, and, and again, those are choices you can make when it comes to exposure therapy. You know, a lot of veterans don't like crowds. Well, you got two choices. Avoid crowds the rest of your life or fucking lean into it. Yep. That's it. Those are your options. Yep. So would you rather go do it when you can control it? Like in your case, hey, you could walk in, you got overwhelmed. All right. You know what? Two minutes. All right. Two minutes is better than no minutes. Yep. And maybe you make it three in the next time. I'm, I quit smoking back in 2009. And I'm like, all right, if I can go an hour in the morning without a cigarette, I can go two. If I can go two, I can go four. If I can go a day, I can go two days. That's it. It's that adage like, oh, I'll quit tomorrow mindset, right, which is a beautiful thing. Or in the case of exposure therapy, I'll give up tomorrow. Today, I'm going to lean into it, and tomorrow I'll give up on getting over this shit. Because your brain was programmed, it can be reprogrammed. Right? That, 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 the word, obviously, I, I fucking love words. Um. I read something recently was talking about mental health and they're like, to teach you how to unlearn things. And I was like, God, is that fuck unlearn? What a, what a garbage fucking use of the English language. Like, how do you, how do you fucking unlearn shit? You know, you can retrain or redevelop or take in new information. This idea of unlearning. Well, no, you can question it. You can't unlearn it because then it gives no credence to what you had learned and believed to be true at some point. And if you unlearn it, then you're, you're 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 bound to make the same fucking choice that didn't work in the first place because you obviously didn't learn. Garbage fucking use of language. Anyways, relearn or learn new. The other thing I've done recently, I can't tell if you're laughing or not. I think you are. 
I the am. other thing I've done recently, I've practiced, this is a thing that I've learned with me recently talking about regulation, is when I do podcasts now, when I really want to get deep and when I want to get um, more vulnerable than not, I hide the video. So right now, like I look at the camera, the people on the YouTubes that are watching, and I got like things up on my screens. I, I can't, I, I'm not seeing Dylan and I'm not seeing me because for me, when I sit here and I listen and, and I take it in, I'm not watching facial reaction. I, I tend to listen better. And I realized that even when I'm with people, I'll be sitting there watching them and they're talking. And all of a sudden, I'm like looking off into the distance. And it's like I'm, I'm taking the words in and, I'm, and I'm, um, I'm not distracted by all the nonverbal communications, you know, because I'm focused. I'm focused on the 7% verbal, not the 97, 93% nonverbal communication skills. It's interesting. Um, well, because words fucking matter. And, 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 and I lean in on my strength. My strength is listening to the words. And then picking out individual words or individual ideas and understanding better. Like, I understood your whole concept, but it's like, well, let's talk about the individual things you said. Um, that's interesting to me. And and that's my strength. And that's something I I picked up in the Army, right? Like, I remember going to B-Knock and control effing like a motherfucker in Adobe. And it's like, yeah, you can read a whole fucking chapter on something. Ultimately, the Army wants to know, do you know this one answer in this one situation? What's the particular thing that matters? And that's something I realized in the military. I'm and and I mean I'm the exact opposite. Like you I, want the narrative. I can I can hear the I hear the message, but yeah. but where I where my strength is is picking up on the tone and the the nonverbals. Yeah, and and, and neither and, and neither one of these are wrong. They they yeah. are what they are. It's just a it's just what we focus on. Well, because we focus on, on what works best for us, at least with me, right? I want to say with us, right? I, I I focus on what my strength is. I struggle understanding people. And so I get rid of 93% of the noise and focus on the 7% that um, the person can control the most, which is the words they use. And that paints their reality. A little smirk, a little look away, a little this, a little that. Fuck. I don't know how to fucking interpret that shit. And I don't, I don't say I don't want, I, it's not interesting to me and it's a struggle to interpret it. So let me focus on my strengths, hmm. not on my weekends, my weaknesses. It's interesting. So I think most people struggle to, to fully, fully comprehend how to use words mm -hmm. from my experience, right? Like most people, Oh yeah. like one of, one of the things that, uh, that I do in my business is you know, we do, I do a values exercise, right? Like, what are your values? What are your principles? What, what is it that, what guiding rules do you determine are your basis of who you are? Um, and I would say 95% of people have a word in their mind, but they've never defined it. They've never clarified exactly what it means. And so the the words that they use to describe themselves or define themselves are actually for the most part not even applicable to the definition that 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 word has or that that word they've been using um and so it's like when i look at that i can, i can interpret for the most part awareness uh, based on your message, but when you, when you use your body language, um, it confirms, uh, exactly whether you, you are fully aware of yourself or not. Um, mm. because it's, it's pretty easy for me to recognize when people are unable to regulate, unable to, to contain, uh, their own dysregulation. Uh, or unable to really confirm who they are and their identity. Um, so they've, 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 t they've told themselves a story that they're not living. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you, you can, they tell, they tell themselves a story that isn't reality. Right. And they can't discern the difference. Correct. Well, that's, that's why I, I, I joke with my employees. One of my employees came up to me the other day. He's like, you're fucking right. And I was like, oh, I'm right about a lot of things. Let's talk about what I'm right about this week. And he's like, he's like, you always say, whichever employees tell you you're going to be the best, because we, we had brought in a bunch of temps. 
he goes, whenever you tell me, listen for the guys that say they're going to do the best, they're, they're, they're the first ones that are going to fall out. They're the first ones that are going to fail. And he's like, dude, you were dead on. He goes, the one guy that day one was like, all right, guys, let's, well, you know, it's like teamwork. Like, this is all it's about. Like, you know, we're going to, you know, embrace this together. Like halfway through the first day, it was like, fuck this, I'm done. And it's like, he, he convinced himself that he was the you rah, rah, bring the team together guy. And in actuality, he, he, he wanted to project on other people what he thought the ideal was when in actuality, he couldn't even convince himself of it. Yeah. That that was, that was the ideal that he needed to live. Um, so I was joke. I, I, I say the more people talk, the less I listen, you know, <laughs> and I'm a, I'm a, and I'm someone that fucking talks a lot. <laughs> right. But, but here's the thing though. And then the other thing, this is another line from um, my next book. Um, I never pretend to know anything. I went to, uh, I don't know if I've talked about it on this podcast, but I went to a, a Muslim Indian wedding a couple of months back and it was interesting. And one of the people at the table, this, he was a doctor. We were, we were uh, collectively, there were six of us, um, figuring out what was going on with this wedding because there's 600 people in this room and we had no clue. Because of the six people at the table, three were European descent, three were of Indian descent. Of the three people from Indian descent, one grew up in Germany, one grew up in Kuwait, and one grew up in Chicago. So they were Indian. However, they didn't understand Indian culture, and everybody was Judeo-Christian, not Muslim. <laughs> So for like 20 minutes there, we're like, oh, maybe this means that, or what, what's going on with this, or why is that that way? And I knew a little bit because we, you know, we studied Muslim tradition and cultures um, prior to I Iraq and certainly prior to Gitmo, uh, have a basic understanding. And so like I knew some things. And finally, the one guy, uh, Rohit, his name was, he's like, you know, because I, I joked, I said, why are we all, we're, 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 we're stupid. Why are we all looking at each other, like trying to figure this out, you know? And he goes, you know. As a doctor, I never pretend to know every anything. He goes, I think that probably would serve us here. I'm like, yeah, you're damn right. And I find that about myself often. When when I realize I'm shutting down and not talking, it's because I, I'm in a room where people are smarter than me. Mm -hmm. Or there, there's a lot more I can get and a lot less I can give. Right? Some people will say that, you know, talking a lot is selfish. No, listening a lot is selfish. Talking a lot is selfless. You're giving of yourself. And so often when I'm talking, I'm doing one of two things. I'm either giving out information that I consider to be factually correct and true and from my perspective adds value to the people around me, or B, I'm talking shit out to figure out what the hell is going on around me. Like in this conversation, it's like, man, we're talking this out. You know, we came into this conversation with no agenda. So it's like, oh, let's talk this thing out. When I feel as though I'm completely overwhelmed, that's when I, sh that's when I shut down and in a good way. I stop talking. I start listening. It, it doesn't happen often. And those are often some of my favorite rooms to be in um, because it, it reinforces that uh, humility, which is not a strength of mine, but it, it, and it reinforces the fact that I, I ought to be humble sometimes, not all the time. <laughs> so, yeah. Let's not get away from our strengths. Hey, oh, for you sure. know what? Character strengths test, according to the Army, my character strengths test, zest for life is my number one character strength, and humility is number 24. Okay. The and, and that's a fact. The Army does I, a character strength test. You never done that before? No. With mass resiliency training? Of course not. Oh my gosh. Who's your who's your do you guys have hold, hold on. In the National Guard is, is resiliency training mandated? No. Annually? No. What the fuck? Field you training. Guys gonna get is that mandated. <laughs> what is? Field training. We ain't got that shit. <laughs> I'm a goddamn All we do I'm is a go to counselor. Field. Well, you know what? If you want to, well, when, not even if, when you want to be more combat effective, you've got to get your thoughts right, Jack. Well, I do that with my guys. The Army, you know, the, the Army National Guard statewide, questionable. I think they're, I think at this point, I, I obviously have to be careful here since I'm still in the Guard and I can't talk too much on the, on the subject. I think from, day one of my enlistment to now the Wisconsin national guard specifically has gotten a lot better at trying to focus on how to take care of soldiers. And so has the army in, in, in a whole, as a whole. Um, but it's still lacking. I think there's still things that, that, um, we don't, we have things like BLC and ALC and SLC and MLC, 
uh, all these leadership courses, right? All the LC is leadership, right? We have those courses, but what it does mm -hmm. is all focus on uh, leadership by by the by the army standard, right? Which is uh, how do you do paperwork? How do you find things in an FM TM? How do you define leadership based on the army standard? But it's not about what I think leadership really requires, which is how to network, how to negotiate, how to clarify, how to communicate, right? Like the, these, the, that, 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 that's what MRT teaches you. Right. But we don't, we don't do that. Right. Like we have master resilience trainers that, that we've sent to school, but because we only have 40 days a year to do all the same things as an active duty battalion or brigade has to do, mm -hmm. We we don't have time for it, right? You don't prioritize it. No, we can't. The, Vic, don't, okay, I can't bullshit word. D don't well, bullshit word. So think, you choose not to prioritize it. So think of it from my level, right? I'm an E6. Yeah, I get told what to do. I don't. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. not given time. You're, so everyone from E6 correct. your below, leadership doesn't prioritize it. Right. Yeah, I got it. your leadership doesn't prioritize. I'm not. I, I, this isn't a personal attack on Dylan. The entire. Uh, uh, Army Na Wisconsin Army National Guard. This is a right use of language. It's not a priority. Yeah. Field training is a priority. Oh, for sure. And I would argue because I'm a proponent for MRT, and I wrote a book uh, based on based on it to a certain extent. Um, I'm a huge proponent for it because when your brain is right, your body will follow. Mm -hmm. So I, I get it. You got all these other things. These other you know. Uh, leadership tasks and drills and all this other shit. And I can also tell you, even in, in our job as career counselors, MRT is like, all right, we're going to talk about this. And it's supposed to be a 90 minute block of instruction. And it's a 15 minute. All right, check the box. And I'm like, well, that's defeats the purpose. Um, it's, it's tough because this is a MRT is like, yeah, it's a program. It's a program wants to shift the culture of the army, mm -hmm. like you, you, the army has been around for a minute. Mm -hmm. Shifting the culture by one degree takes yeah. years, if not decades and thousands and thousands and millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, and I was not a proponent for MRT. I was voluntold to go to the school. The person that was going to go to it, uh, I can't recall something happened where they couldn't go. And I was like, Hey, I'll go at the time. My marriage was shit and I was quitting my job anyways, right before deployment. So I was like, all right, I'll go get away from my soon be ex-wife for two weeks. That seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> Turns out it was. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it was whatever. Uh, and now um, it wasn't, I mean, and, and, and now it's, it's like that, that the good news, bad news thing that it, now it's the basis for my understanding of life. Yeah. So obviously I'm, I have a pretty, uh, pretty committed to it. it makes sense to me that you, we, we train in so yes 20 going back to what i was saying 24 character strengths you can take the you can take the assessment not very difficult Where it's a worthy it? endeavor you should share the link in this episode so that we can all take it oh my god you did your that's for taylor not for you <laughs> yeah hold on you know what let me let me let me think if i can find this strengths i can't spell the word strengths it was also developed by the University of Pennsylvania, which I found out today, uh, Ivy League school. No big deal. Um, nice. Via character strengths. So the MRT was developed by, um, this is actually in my book. You know what people should do? Buy my book. And the link is in there. <laughs> Again, so many, plug. So I'm many a, shameless plugs. <laughs> I, am, I tell you what, for people watching at home, here it is. Words fucking matter. Retrain your brain to use language that serves you where you'll dive up into 13 beautiful chapters of empowering language to turn victor statement or victim statements into victor statements. Sometimes people are a victim of their circumstance, and I will teach you in this book how to transform that victim of your circumstance to being a victor of your story or your money back. <laughs> there you go. That was pretty cheese dick. I'm not going to lie. While, All right, let me see. While you Hold on. shameless plug see. your book, I'm going to shameless plug my book, Defy the Darkness. Oh, my God. And it's there only we go. ten chapters, and it's on Audible, <laughs> so you can read, you can listen to it instead of okay, reading. How? It. Got it. Uh, that's a, that. That was that was a shit move, Dylan. That was hey, you did it. That was a it. shit move because you knew you know you know that I'm in the middle of doing my audiobook, 
and you know <laughs> that I'm not done. That's and called I know that's called inspiration, Andy. Yeah, yeah. And I know that you don't know that I got an email earlier today that basically said, Hey, you recorded half your book, it's garbage. Oh, um, no. <laughs> so, so, apparently they don't like it when you're turning pages, it's loud. Yeah. Um, and Dude. and they can tell when you're sitting down and they said I'm talking, not projecting. Yeah. I got a whole list of things I need to work on in my audio book. Audio book coming out soon. Let me soon know if you need me to subjective. come by and help you out. <laughs> Unless you want to read the motherfucker for me. I don't see that happening, Jack. I mean, I could, but it won't be as spicy as you. <laughs> oh, my God. You know I mean? I'll, I'll, pr I'll, I'll open a random page. Keep it simple. Say what you mean. Mean what you say. Don't make things unnecessarily. Unnecess Jesus. Un see, unnecessarily. Like, that's a Here, let that's me an get unnecessarily my complicated word. This is especially important for leaders. Tell the other person what you're looking for, what your parameters are, and what you can and what you can expect from them in no uncertain terms. Cut your language down to presenting facts and asking for results. What page? Things you on? get a lot clearer and cleaner. Avoid spouting a three dollar word when a nickel will do. That's a good fucking line. I got that from Army. I had a math sergeant at a seventy nine Victor school that said, "Don't use a three dollar word when a nickel will do." Well, that's a fucking good line, Jack. There you go. That's uh, enunciate. Don't have. Saliva in your mouth. There's a lot of things I need to work on. Yeah. What page were you on? You want to? Uh, well, my page is different than yours because I have the. This is the 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 you got not, fancy copy. This is the this is the broken version. This is the hey, why is half that picture cut off version? Uh, that was page seventy five. So it, also also in my book, take a look pictures. So for people at home, man, right? The Marines it's are 150 love this. pages. Oh my god, it's one hundred fifty <laughs> pages. I'll tell you what, there's at least 10 pages of pictures, 10 to 15. It's like 120. This guy was like, so, hey, I read your book There's really a fast. Video so here goes, here we're, like, oh, we're on the same page. Here we go. Here we go. We're on the same page. <laughs> video game Have control. <laughs> there you go. Oh, my God. Uh, there you go. I wrote a book. I, you know what the other thing is? I don't know if I told you this, Dylan. I, I drove home a couple, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. Uh, I was driving home from volleyball. And I'm like, I, I, uh, I wrote a book called Words Fucking Matter. Like, who does that? And I started, I laughed to myself on my way home. Like, God, I'm gonna spend the rest of my life explaining to people Why that I wrote a book, matter. a book called Words Fucking Matter. And then my daughter, I love it. My daughter's out there pitching it, and she calls it Words F Wording Matter. And I'm like, that's. <laughs> um, Someday she'll she'll get to say the real thing. <laughs> She can say it right now. I don't give a shit. It's, <laughs> it's, come on now. Um, no, she actually started. She started reading my book. She started reading it, and uh, you know, ship shape. I I obviously wrote a book called "Defy the Darkness," and now my friends make fun of me because they ask me, "Hey, Dylan, are you are you defying the darkness right now? Are you um, yeah, are you currently? And, and what, it's what's like, going on? What's going on you, with you in your darkness? You yeah. sandbag and sons of bitches." <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? And that's the no good deed goes unpunished in the, oh, for in, the sure. in the real world. Right? Like that's the issue. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I'm I'm tracking like I'm tracking like a high five ECR. All right, we're coming up on the one hour mark. We're starting to trail off into God knows what. Logical we're starting time. to read our own books. <laughs> yeah. When you know we're running out of material uh when we're starting to read our own books. All right, top takeaway today, Dylan. Let's let's get into it. Uh, I think it's it's really interesting that you are a message guy and you you mm -hmm. pick up on the message and you tune out or you try to tune out the uh, the tone and the body language and nonverbal aspect. I didn't I, I kind of picked up on that you did it, um, but I think it's really interesting that we are literally the opposite in terms of what we focus on when communicating with people. It just makes that this podcast all the more fun. Well it, well, it does because it comes down to okay, we have two different sets of strengths, and 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 we're both doing what's best for us. Mm -hmm. So that's that, that's and that's the point of you know, I jokingly talk about you know humility being a low strength. It's like, well, hey, if you need someone that's gonna be humble, let's look around here. We probably have somebody you know a better tool in the repertoire than Andy. If you need someone that's loud. I got you covered, Jack. <laughs> right, and, and so. And, and, and I'm unapologetic about it. 
right? Because I grew up in a life of like, oh, you got to control yourself. And no, I got to be the best version of myself. And sometimes that means leaning into the, the thing that people dislike the most about me. Because yeah. that's a them problem, not a me problem. Um, takeaway is simple this week. It, it's, it's, um, it's about consistency. You know, as we're making this transformation, it is very simple to stop doing what we know is, is good for us, to stop working out, to stop going to meetings, whether it's AA counseling, you know, in our case, the podcast, right? We, we've gone, you know, in the last couple of weeks here, we, we've fell out of our consistency because of family vacations, whatever else. And it's like this week, it's like, okay, didn't have a guest. We could have been like, ah, just push another week. And it's like, no, be consistent. We give ourselves this hour. Um, I also was looking um, right before this at our YouTube following. Our YouTube following is growing. It, it, we get more YouTube following um, than we do podcast following. And it's like, okay, people are listening and watching what we're doing. And and um, so what we're doing is worthy of their time, right? Time is our greatest asset. It's worthy of our time. And, and therefore, it's, the audience is all saying it's worthy of theirs. So um, be consistent with what you do and who you are and what you say, and then you will live that life you want. And so um, consistency is key. It's, you know, um, I talk about it. Actually, I will I will quote the book here, Stephen Covey, because this is something I have to consistently um, remind myself of. And, it's, and so much uh, of it is a um, consistency within the book. Now, of course, I say that. Here it is. Stephen R. Covey. So one of the first books I, I read as an adult was Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And so what Stephen Covey says is, sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an action and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. And and that that's the good stuff. Um, and that's what it comes down to. Planting the thoughts and reaching that destiny that you want because it's your life. You only have the one live it, choose it the way you want it to be. And it, it all comes down to what you choose out of this life. So we'll leave it at that. I talk about consistency. Um, Dylan talks about, you know, leaning into the strengths of others and in your own internal strengths, um, because we have strengths, no weaknesses. I'm Andy. He's Dylan. Another great episode of the Welcome Home podcast. If anyone hasn't said to you lately, welcome home.